And now for tonight's speaker. Vicky McGrath is the Learning and Audience Development Officer at the Museum of Richmond and has been in that role since 2016. She has many years' experience of working in museums and heritage education and was previously at Bucks County Museum and the Royal Dal Children's Gallery. While the museum is without a curator and executive officer, Vicky has also been stepping up and taking on some of the aspects of that role. Vicky will tell us about an infamous crime from Victorian days, the story of Kate Webster, Richmond's murderess. Please now give a very warm welcome to Vicky McGrath. Suddenly goes dark. Right, can everyone hear me all okay? And I'm very aware that I'm kind of hiding behind not the tallest of people, so please bear with me. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome, Robert, and thank you for inviting me to speak here this evening. So, as Robert says, my talk this evening is the oh-so-jolly subject of the Richmond murderess. I, was, I did check with Simon that he was sure this is the topic that he wanted, but he insisted, so there we are. So... The outline of the talk this evening is that we're going to discuss a little bit about what Richmond was like in 1879, then who was Julia Thomas, who was the victim of this crime, who was Kate Webster, the perpetrator of the crime, and then actually looking at what happened from the sources we have available and what this story does actually tell us about Victorian Britain and its values. So, Richmond in this era. Leading up to this period in time, in the Georgian era, as I'm sure you're all very aware, Richmond was a very small market town. It's not even a market town, because of course Kingston's got the market charter. It's a very, very small place. It's the playground for the rich and the royalty. So from 1690, it starts to develop from this village into a small prosperous town because of the investment of rich merchants looking for some houses and property to invest their money in. This is, and again, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this one, is a print called The Prospect of Richmond. It was done in 1726, and it gives you a really good idea of what Richmond was like in the 18th century. So you've got a lot of buildings all around Richmond Green, of course, Maids of Honor Row, and the remains of the palace. Then we've got Hill Street going up the hill, and of course, St. Mary Magdalene's Church here. But the main thing, point I'm trying to make with this one is that we are surrounded by open fields, and it's even before we've got the bridge crossing the Thames at this point. This map also helps make it even clearer um, the way Richmond looked in 1822. So this is just before the start of Victoria's reign in 1837. So Richmond, even though it's a fashionable resort, is still just a small country town. The great fields stretch from Kew Road across to Mortlake and Sheen Roads to the summit of the hill. But the reason why this changes is this. The railway reaches Richmond from Nine Elms in 1846, and it expands further and further west over the years. The station at this point was slightly further south than the present one, though if you really want to know more about the first station, I believe Paul is the man that you need to speak to. I know that this is his area of expertise. So it arrives in August 1848, and what's particularly special about our bridge here at Richmond is that it is the first ever railway bridge over the River Thames. Then after the railways arrived, it took just one generation for all of those fields that we saw in the prospect of Richmond to disappear under a network of new roads, suburban villas, villas and workmen's cottages. You can see then, by the time we get to 1900, that... Oh, I think I've skipped one, sorry. Oh, yeah, there we go. So when we get to 1865, this hashes in a massive period of growth for Richmond. The population um, was 4,628 in 1801, but by 1851, it had doubled to more than nine, doubled this to 9,255. Because of the growing population, the parish took on more and more responsibilities as local government until it became unworkable and Richmond sought to incorporation as a borough. Richmond then becomes a borough on the 16th of July, 1980, and it, uh, sorry, 1890, and, <laughs> sorry about that, and then in 1892, the boundaries were extended to include, include Peterton, Kew, North Sheen, and part of Mortlake. Ham doesn't join us until 1933. But by the end of Victoria's reign, the area is completely unrecognisable, which is why all, these maps are very, very basic, but they do make the delightful point of just how different 
we are, and it is all thanks to the railway, and of course the overground going all the way up to Hammersmith, the underground, sorry. I get confused because it's a part of the underground that doesn't actually go underground, but there you are. So the wealthy are still being drawn to the air at this time for the same reasons people still live here today. Excellent transport links, when they're not on strike, open spaces, you're near to the river, and it's well established as a fashionable place to live. But along with these wealthy people, ooh, Clicker's still not quite happy, you get the working class who are coming here to look for work in these houses that are being built all over the place. Running a household in this era is physically demanding. It's very easy with our modern sensibilities for us to forget what life is like without a hoover or a washing machine. And I know personally, I will never go back to not having a dishwasher. There's no um, central heating either. Again, something very, very easy for us to forget. So everything must be done by hand. And if you're part of the middle classes, you don't want to do this yourself. So this is when your working class servants come in. The middle classes at this point as well, they're a very powerful part of the society because they have got more money than they've ever had before and they want to spend it. They want to show that they have arrived in this sort of weird social sense of, um, I've made it, look at me with my money, I can employ servants now. It's an important status symbol at this point. And you end up with this bizarre kind of parallel household. You have the family and then you also have the servants. And the servants are supposed to scurry around and be as sort of discreet as possible so as not to interrupt the life of the family in the main house. It also creates a feeling of uneasiness because these working class people, they are supposed to know their place. But there's also the stereotype of the working classes. They're rough, they're ready, they like to drink a little bit too much. And who are you really letting into your home? It is a great sort of placement of trust that they are employing these people and often housing them in the same home as their families, which actually then brings us rather nicely to our story. So this is Julia Thomas. She was born in St. James's Piccadilly in around 1824. Her first husband was Mr. Murray, who had died by 1851. She's described as being educated and intelligent as she worked as a school teacher in Kingston before her second marriage. Her second marriage um, was to James Thomas and records have them living in Finsbury in 1871. And James was then to pass away on the 28th of June, 1873. It's unclear if she ever had children. If she did, none of them survived infancy, which very sadly is not unusual at this time. She was five foot four in height, described as eccentric with an excitable temperament and was just always known to be traveling. It wasn't unusual for her family not to know where she was. Her friend, Charles Mahennick of Ambler Road in Finsbury, described her as an amiable, good natured sort of lady. She was about 55 or 56 years old. She was not stout and she was animated in her manner and appeared reasonably strong. She was not an invalid, she was an ordinary person she played the piano well. And that really kind of tells you what is expected from a Victorian woman at this point. You're supposed to be accomplished. You're supposed to be engaging, but not too engaging because you don't want to frighten anybody. She was described as wealthy, but not poor. Her, hus her second husband had left her 1,500 pounds in his will, which is about 120,000 pounds in today's money. So she liked to flaunt her jewellery and her clothes. Her friend, Mrs. Loder, would later describe her as being fond of dress and jewellery. However, she would often take in a lodger when money was tight, as she did when she lived in St. Mary's Villas, which is now part of Townsend Road. Despite these um, descriptions of her by her peers, she had a reputation for being a harsh employer with irregular habits that meant she had difficulty finding and retaining servants. So again, you kind of see the sort of parallel world that's going on. Her friends are all describing her as a sort of nice, slightly eccentric character, but she can't keep servants. So it really kind of shows that at the same time, Julia is treating her friends very differently to the way she treats her employees and that it might not be the nicest way. It's that whole thing of like, um, you, there's different ways that you talk to your equals and the way that you talk to the people you perceive that you're better than socially. So where she lived in Richmond is this building here. It's referred to as a couple of different addresses. Um, one is two Mayfield, the other is two Vine Cottages. 
I'm going to refer to it as vine cottages throughout, as this is what it most commonly referred to in the court transcripts and the newspapers at the time. It's the house on the left-hand side of the image, so it's semi-detached, and it was large for a woman on her own, so it would stand to reason that she would need a live-in servant. In September 1878, she took out a seven-year lease on the property from Miss Elizabeth Ives, who lived with her widowed mother next door at number one, which is on the right-hand side. The house was described as being a small but very respectable house, and its appearance would suggest that it is the dwelling of a person in good circumstances. But as she was new to Richmond, it was noted that she had numerous acquaintances but no close, close friends. But to give you an idea of just how different it was for Thomas when she moved here, we've got this um, map from the period, and it still makes me chuckle just how different it looks. Where's the Chertsey Road? But of course, we've got the railway line, and she's just around here. So it's just a few roads away from Rack, where it is today. So I'm sure you're all reasonably familiar with this area, so you can see just how different it was. Yeah. It, may, it just amazes me every time how much has been built in such, such a short time here in Richmond. And to make that point, we've got a modern map to show you. <laughs> so yeah, it gives you a good idea of, like, she's not in the sort of proper fancy bit, which is around the green, she's on the outskirts, and they are continuing to fill in and build on the open land around it. So, the other half of the story, Kate Webster described as young, tall, and strong. Apparently, she was built like a navvy, everything that Thomas was not. She was later described as the Daily Telegraph as a tall, strongly made woman of about five foot five inches in height, with a sallow and much freckled complexion and large and prominent teeth. She was born Kate Lawler in Kil... I'm, my um, Irish pronunciation is appalling, so I apologise. In Killarney, County West Court, Wexford, near um, Enniscorthy in about 1849. So it's roughly where the red marker is here, so in proper South Ireland. She claimed to have been married to a Captain Webster in her teens and that they'd had four children, but sadly he and the children had passed away. She was imprisoned for larceny in Wexford in 1864 when she was only about 15 years old. So larceny, it's a wonderfully <laughs> old-fashioned phrase, but it's a, essentially a fancy way of saying that she was stealing without threat or force. It's not a term that's really used in legal times anymore because um, larceny has, is now classed as burglary, robbery, or fraud. So we've moved on a bit from that language, sadly. So... Ooh, sorry, the pages are stuck together. She came to England when she was about 18 in 1867, and this is when you start finding criminal records for Webster. She spends more time in prison for larceny in Birmingham, Liverpool, and London. Apparently, she was notorious for lodging house robberies, which basically she'd go and rent a room that was full of furniture. She'd sell the furniture as if it was her own, and then she'd try and disappear. By 1873, she'd moved to the Rose Gardens in Hammersmith and made family, a friends with a family called the Porters, who are very important later on in this story. Apparently, she doted on one of their younger daughters, who sadly did not survive childhood. On the 18th of April, 1874, it is recorded that Webster had a son at Kingston Workhouse, whom she named John W. Webster. I haven't been able to find out who the father was, and very frustratingly, the sources I have read all too easily suggest that Webster may have turned to sex work to help supplement her income and her larceny. She always claimed that um, there was actually a man called Mr. Strong, but again, the sources, they don't really fixate on him and he gets redacted a lot. So it's a bit hazy, it's a bit fuzzy, as sadly would be all too familiar with stories for women like Kate. She was later say that she was apparently um, forced to turn to crime as it's the only way that she could support her child. It is clear that from the sources she was a devoted mother because at any point she could have just abandoned the child but she does stick through and through thick and thin. Then by 1879, she had met um, a woman called Sarah Creese who apparently she had met through this mysterious Mr. Strong. And they'd known each other for three and a half years at that point, and she lived with her son and the Creases at 3 Mitchell Road in Richmond in early January. Later at the trial, Creese went on to say that Webster had always been a kind-hearted, good sort of girl, and that she was very fond of me and very fond of the child, meaning her son John. So, how did Thomas and Webster meet? 
Well, this is where the creases come in. Crease found Webster work with a lady called Mrs. Lucy Marie Loder, who was a dress um, maker at number two, the Crescent. At the trial, Loder stated that Webster was a very obliging girl and did her work well. Loder was acquainted with Thomas and recommended Webster to Thomas when Thomas was yet again on the lookout for another new servant. So on the 29th of January, 1879, Webster moved into two vine cottages and started working as a general servant. This meant doing absolutely everything, from lighting the fires, to cooking, to cleaning, washing clothes. It's a physically demanding, time-consuming job. On an average, she would be working from six o'clock in the morning to at least nine o'clock at night. Her son stays with the creases and she visits him every Sunday. According to the court accounts, things started well, but very, very quickly soured as Thomas's reputation for being very difficult met with Webster's no-nonsense personality. She was described as being volatile. Essentially, she grew frustrated with Thomas's nitpicking at her work and following her around the house, criticizing her as she worked. Webster would later state, at first I thought her to be a nice lady, but I found her very trying, and she used to do many things to annoy me during my work. When I had finished my work in the rooms, she used to go over it again after me and point out the places where she said I did not clean, showing an evidence of nasty spirit towards me. Another source of friction between the two oop, was no doubt Webster's drinking. This is very sort of standard for working class people at a time, but it was a great source of contention for the religious Thomas. Two doors down from their house, which you can see is now blue on the left-hand side, is this white building called the Hole in the Wall Pub. As Thomas's nagging grew worse, apparently Webster spent more time at the pub. And so with her temper and her drinking habit, Webster was now fulfilling the stereotype of the Irish immigrant that was prevalent at this time, that they were lazy and all too easily distracted by alcohol. Things then come to the head at the end of February 1879. Things were so bad between the two women that Thomas had started telling people that she was actually frightened of Webster. A note was made in her diary on the 28th of February, gave Catherine warning to leave. But it was later agreed that she could stay a couple more days, presumably to organise another position elsewhere or tie up any loose ends. This then brings us to ooh, Sunday the 2nd of March 1879. It was noted that Thomas was late for her church service at the Presbyterian Lecture Hall on Little Green. I'm sure a lot of you will recognize this as it is now um, a grade two listed building that has been adopted for residential use. Thomas was visibly upset when she arrived at the service and she could not sit in her usual seat, so she had to sit at her back, at the back. Apparently she was late because she'd been waiting for Webster to return home as she needed her help to get ready for the service. Because what you have to remember, Victorian, um, Sunday best, it's almost like it was designed for you to need help to get into it with things like your corsets and your fiddly hook and eye fastenings. Again, it's part of the statement of your wealth as a middle class person that you need someone not just to clean your house, but also to help you get dressed. Webster did have Sunday afternoons off, which is when she normally went to go and visit her son at the creases. But however, this one she decided to spend the afternoon drinking and returned late for Thomas. Thomas had told a fellow congregant that she had been delayed by the neglect of her servant to return home at the proper time, and that Webster had flown into a terrible passion upon being rebuked. Thomas was so agitated by what she ha had passed between the two women that she actually left the church 10 minutes early, arriving home around 9 p.m. That was the last time that she was seen alive. Later at the trial, Mrs. Ives, who lived next door with her daughter, that was Thomas's landlady, recalled she heard a thump later that evening, much like a chair falling over, but at the time paid it no mind. Apparently the walls were thin between the two houses, so it wasn't unusual to hear some noise. On Monday the 3rd of March, neighbours heard the sound of chopping wood and washing clothes, but not voices. That wouldn't have been unusual because Monday was wash day for most houses. It was the wet part of the long, arduous task where, of washing clothes and linens would begin. The neighbors reported that Webster was doing the washing unusually early at 8 a.m. and that there was a funny smell in the air. But they might not have thought much of this at the time because we have to remember this is the era before sewage and drainage. Richmond would have smelt very different than today. William Dean, the coal agent, who you can see on the right-hand side, he called for um, Thomas, and when Webster opened the door, apparently she only opened it far enough for her face to be visible. She told him that Thomas was not in, and she did not know when she would return. 
Mary Roberts, apprentice to the neighbour, called to say that a man would be coming to repair the roof as Thomas had requested, but Webster told her this was no longer necessary, calling to her from an upper window. On Tuesday the 4th, Webster left the house to visit her friends and former neighbours, the Porters, in Hammersmith. The Porters hadn't seen her in six years, but thought she had done well for herself, considering the elegant way she was now dressed. They later said she was now called Mrs. Thomas, having now married and inherited a house that she wanted to dispose of, and of all the assets as well, and then moved to Glasgow, as instructed by her father, who sadly was ill. Henry Porter and his 16-year-old son Thomas walked her back to the station, taking turns at carrying her Gladstone-style bag. It was a little heavy. She claimed it contained a Bible and a couple of books. They stopped for a drink at the Rising Sun pub, where Webster excused herself, saying that she needed to go and quickly meet a friend. When she returned half an hour later, it was without the bag. It was never found, but there are differing ideas as to what was in it, which we will get on to shortly. At the station, Webster asked young Robert to come with her to Richmond as she needed some help moving a large, heavy box that she was giving to her friends. His parents agreed, as long as this boy was returned home that night. Together, Webster and young Porter took the box to Richmond Bridge, where she told the boy she would wait for her friend alone. Porter later recalled hearing a splash as he walked away. He and a passing man peered over the bridge to see what had caused the splash, with a man remarking, hmm, a barge, I suppose. Webster soon caught up with the boy and told him that her friend now had the box. He wanted to return home, but he had no money for a cab, and the last train had already gone back to Hammersmith. Apparently, he didn't want to go home with Webster, but he had no choice. So she gave him some rum to drink, made him a bed on the kitchen floor, and in the morning, the boy safely returned to Hammersmith. Then Wednesday, the 5th of March, 1879, sees the discovery of the chest only a few hours after Webster had disposed of it. A coal porter named Henry Wheatley was passing Barnes Railway Bridge at around 7 a.m. He was driving a cart along the terrace um, with a Mr. Kennison and spotted the box, and he recognised it as the sort that we used for storing bonnets and pulled it out of the river. So again, we've got a lovely shot <laughs> of Barnes Bridge from the terrace in around 1890. So again, it's, it's quite remarkable how different and yet how similar it was all at the same time. So, ooh, so, and we've also got a map from the period, so you can see how far the box did manage to travel in around seven to nine hours, which even though you think between here and Barnes, not really that far, you always forget the twists and turns of the river makes it a little bit further than you think. So apparently when Wheatley kicked the box open, he found body parts wrapped in brown paper. Kennison dismissed it as butcher's meat that had been thrown away, but Wheatley was not so sure. He dismissed Kennison's objections and went to the police station further along the river. And this is a quote that we have from Wheatley. I saw the box in the Thames at about 6.45 a.m. on Wednesday, March 5th, on the lower side of Barnes Bridge. The tide was not ebbing from the top of it. It was half afloat. It had cord twice around it, across. I kicked it and broke it to pieces. The handle was off, I believe. I went to the station to fetch someone, leaving a man called Kerrison in charge of it. Before I went, I saw a lot of what looked like cooked meat inside of it. It was quite full. Police Sergeant Thomas Child followed Wheatley to the box, and upon seeing its contents, he called for a Dr. Adams to examine it. Dr. Adams roughly pieced together the pieces to assemble the body of a woman, aged between 20 and 30, judging by the brown hair on the armpit. I, I wish I was making that up, but I'm really not. As there was no decomposition, um, Adams concluded that the flesh had been boiled, but there was no head to identify the body. One foot was missing, along with some other minor body parts. The skin had the texture of parchment, and it had been sawn and chopped roughly, making Adams conclude that this was not the work of a medical student. It was, in fact, body parts, not a complete body, that adds to the sensationalism of the story as it breaks, and it becomes known as the Barnes Mystery. Ooh. So, a foot and an ankle are then found at Twickenham in an allotment dung heap by a man named George William Court on Monday the 10th of March. On the 10th or 11th of March, then Webster asked Porter to dispose of the artificial teeth that had belonged to her deceased aunt. He took them to a Mr. Niblets, do you like that name, a jeweller in Mr. Hammersmith. He got six, six shillings for them, which is about 25 pounds in today's money. And Webster gave the porters a shilling, so about four quid, as a thanks for his help. She'd also been bringing the food, the 
flat had been ordered for Thomas to the family in Hammersmith. So Thomas Bond, the doctor who is then called to come and look at the um, remains of the body, he's actually an important lecturer in forensic science who works at Westminster um, Hospital because it sounds a little bit like um, Dr. Adams knew that he was starting to get out of his depth. So he was a surgeon to the Metropolitan Police's A Division, which meant he was routinely called in for cases like this. And later, he would be called on to help with the Whitechapel murders. Bond was described as being amongst the best of medical witnesses, as his evidence was always clear. So he discounted this as the work of medical students, as he said, and I quote, the division had been made without any relation to anatomical structure, and it might have been produced by a meat saw. He had no doubt that the parts had been boiled. But he came to some very different conclusions to Dr. Adams. He felt that the woman was short and middle-aged instead. The Websters took, Webster took her son from the creases on the 12th of March instead, then leaving him with the porters in Hammersmith. So at this point, she is going back and forth between Richmond and Hammersmith, spending more time with her son and the porters. At the trial, Mrs. Porter recollected that on Sunday the 16th of March, they actually went on a boating trip together, which is rather nice. And at this point, Webster was still living at Vine Cottages and no one had noticed that Thomas was missing. But as I said, she was known for being eccentric and going off and traveling whenever she felt like it. So at this point, people didn't connect the two. They didn't realize that, you know, that Thomas was missing and connect it with what was going on with Barnes. At the, at the time, at this point in the timeline, it was believed that the body might actually be that of a German maid who'd not turned up at her new job because it was believed she'd own a similar box. But luckily for this particular maid, she was actually found safe and sound later in Weymouth. At this time, the Porters had introduced a Webster to John Church, who owned the Rising Sun pub in Hammersmith, which is the building you can see on the right-hand side, because it's now a residence and not a pub. This ex-army man was looking for new furniture to furnish the pub, and the Porters, oh, we've got a friend. She needs to sell a house. She needs to sell all the furniture in it. What luck. So Church visited the house in Richmond a few times over the next few days, and they agreed a price of £65 for the furniture and the contents that he wanted, which is about £4,500 in today's money. There was some feeling that at this point, when people look back with the beauty of hindsight, that perhaps Church should have been suspicious, but maybe he looked the other way because his eye, he had his eye on a bargain for all this wonderful furniture and other bits and pieces. But there are also tales of Webster Church and the Elder Porter basically going on pub crawls around Richmond at this point over the next few nights, um, which raised a few eyebrows on this quiet residential street on the outskirts of Richmond. The removal rounds then arrive at Vine Cottages on Tuesday the 18th of March. Miss Ives, the landlady, of course, who's living next door at number one, inquired as to where the furniture was going and who had authorised its removal. Apparently, she said to the removal man, you can't take the goods. Mrs. Thomas has taken the house for a term of years, and we are the owners. Where is Mrs. Thomas? The workmen were confused. They thought Catherine was Mrs. Thomas. So Webster told Ives, Mrs. Thomas has sold the things, and this man can show you the receipt. Mr. Westcombe is to take them to Hammersmith. But she would not answer the straightforward question of where Thomas was. Apparently, this was when Webster panicked, told the men to stop, put the furniture back, but she'd made a mistake. Some of the dresses that had already been thrown in the van and that were on their way to Hammersmith had pockets and they had letters in them. One from a friend of Thomas's and one from Webster's uncle in Ireland. A panicked Webster took flight. She collected her young son from the porter's house in Hammersmith, took a train from King's Cross to Liverpool and there took a boat to Ireland, taking refuge at her uncle's farm in Enesgorthy. At this point... Ooh, Sorry. Church then returned to Richmond to speak to the neighbour, Mrs. Ives. It sounds like he was desperate to get his hands on the furniture as arranged, but apparently Ives slammed the door in his face. So back at Hammersmith, his wife Maria went through the clothing that he did have and, of course, found the letters. The letter was from Mrs. Thomas's friend, the Men Menix of Ambler Road in Finsbury Park. So Church went to speak with them on the 21st of March. Now that Webster disappeared, he was trying to figure out what was going on. This raised alarm bells, and so the men in the next passed this on to Thomas's solicitor, who made inquiries around Richmond and found that Thomas had not been seen for three weeks, and along with the commotion that had been going on at the house. 
Hughes then contacted this gentleman here, Inspector Pearman, who'd already been investigating the body in the box at Barnes, and he started to get more suspicious. Pearman and Hughes then found out about Church and had his home searched on Saturday, the 22nd of March. They found some of Thomas's jewellery, as um, identified by her friends, and Church told them of his dealings with Webster, so they went on to search the house in Richmond. The Ives gave them access. Pearman said, he, we found everything in great confusion. The furniture packed up and bed linen wearing apparel packed in three large boxes which were corded. The carpets were up in the three back bedrooms while the dining room and drawing room carpets were partly turned up at the sides of the rooms. No one was in the house. Then on Monday the 24th of March, the Barnes mystery transformed into the Richmond murder. Pearman returned to the house to search the basement, scullery and kitchen. He recalled this at the later trial. I searched the ashes under the kitchen grate and found a quantity of charred bones and some burnt buttons of a wo woman's dress. I found more charred bones, these being in the copper furnace. Taking the copper out of the brickwork, I found halfway down a fatty substance adhering to the sides. I found what happened to be a blood stain on the wainscot of the room called the long bedroom. In the fire, they found charred bones and burnt um, buttons. So this fatty residue was in the copper, which you can see the le lid propped up in the background there. They found a handle which matched the box at Barnes, the cord that matched the cord to tie the box closed, blood in Thomas's bedroom, and evidence that someone had tried to clean up the mess. A chopper, a knife, but not a saw, and Thomas's diary stating that she had told Webster to leave. The police issued posters saying Webster was wanted for stealing plate and the supposed murder of her employer. Webster was soon tracked down to her uncle's farm. She was arrested on Friday the 28th of March and on Saturday the 29th of March um, she began her journey back to London. Her uncle refused to take her son so the poor boy was taken straight to the local workhouse. On the steamboat between Dublin and Holyhead she began to tell the police her story. Is there another person in custody for the murder? There ought to be. The innocent should not suffer for the guilty. At first, she blamed Church and Porter, claiming that she and Church had known each other for years and were having an affair. He had visited the house on the 3rd of March when she had left to visit her son, and on her return, she found Thomas dying, having been stabbed by Church, who said he would do the same to her if she ever told anyone. Over the following days, they disposed of the body and began to sell Thomas's possessions. The idea was they could use the money so that Church could leave his wife and they could run away together. This wouldn't have been dismissed out of hand as it would have presented the police with a much more pleasing narrative in the sense that the stereotype of an aggressive, working-class, ex-army man had forced a poor, widowed mother into helping him commit this violent crime. When Church was arrested on Sunday the 30th March, Apparently, he laughed. He found it so ridiculous. He barely knew Webster, and he had a solid alibi. He was working in his pub, and he hosted a meeting of the Oak Slate Club that um, apparently he was a chair of um, on the day that it, Webster claimed he had committed the murder. So there were loads of people who could uh, assess to where he was. But the charges were not dropped until Friday, the 18th of April, 1879, which shows you that the police really did want to prefer the story that this man had committed this crime instead of a woman. But the body parts keep turning up. On the 26th and 28th of March, more rapains were mound. A carpet bag with burnt bones, a chopper and female clothing. Inspector Pearman took them to Dr. Bond. He found that there were no duplicates of those already found in the box, making him believe that they were, belonged to the same body, along with his analysis that the bones matched in regard to their relative size. The magistrates then began to examine the case in the vestry hall on Paradise Road, which is now the Richmond Paris Lands Charities office and the vineyard pop-up charity shop next to the Paradise Road car park. The woman was pale, this is a direct quote, but she was firm and self-possessed, with no trace of her excitement in her demeanour. She had no characteristics of a criminal in her face, and though not handsome, not ill-looking. Her jacket was of shabby cloth, trimmed with imitation fur, and her dress of the material and cut usually favoured by respectable servants. Her hat was stylish and out of keeping with a servant's position. But what you need to remember is that this quote is from when she was being described by um, people when they thought Church had committed the crime. 
When it's decided that um, it becomes clear that she worked alone, the media began to masculinize and demonize her appearance. And instead of this sort of pleasant looking, smartly dressed woman, she becomes an individual with very low and very brutal instincts, with a physics, physique and demeanor which indicated much mi muscular power. There you go. You, you think our newspapers today are good with their headlines? They got nothing on the Victorians. So, Webster's trial then takes place at the Old Bailey and begins on Wednesday, the 2nd of July, 1879. The judge is Mr. Judge Lord Denman, which is who, the gentleman on the left-hand side. The prosecution was led by Solicitor General, which is Mr. Hardinge Gifford, on the right-hand side. Webster's defence lawyer was a prominent London barrister called Warner Slay, who I haven't been able to find an image for yet. You can download the transcript of the trial from the Old Bailey website, um, but it is a very tricky read. They only recorded the responses of the person being cross-examined, not the questions the lawyer asked. It's a bit of a funny document to read. So a lot of it is Church and Porter being questioned and witnesses being brought against Webster. So you have a George Henry, Henry Rudd, sorry, from Old George Mortlake, who was Thomas's dentist to improve the proved that the false teeth she asked Porter to sell did indeed belong to Thomas. You had Edith Mahennick, the daughter of the Mahennick friends, who had actually worked for Thomas before Webster, who identified the box as, um, that was found in the Thames as belonging to Thomas. She said it had been kept in her room, and it stands to reason that her room then would have become Kate's room. Then we have Emily Hoare of Three Charlotte Cottages, Richmond, who did some needlework for Thomas. She claimed that she had embroidered the skirt for Thomas, which Webster was wearing when she was arrested. There were two witnesses that could provide Porter, so the gentleman from Hammersmith, with an alibi. But however, Church, the pub landlord who tried to buy all the furniture, he had no less than nine witnesses that could provide him with an alibi because of him working at the pub and chairing his meeting of his local club. But the most damning witness for um, Webster was Mary Durden, a straw bonnet maker from London Road, Kingston, who stated that Webster had told her on Tuesday, the 25th of February, that her aunt had died and that she inherited a house and the contents that she needed to dispose of. This is so damning as this was evidence of premeditation. The trial lasted for six days and it was eagerly reported by the press. I know that doesn't seem a long time to us today, because even the Wagatha Christie trial took seven days um, last year. But it, at this period, two days was considered a long time for a trial. They were much, much shorter. Webster's defense was essentially that there was no proof that the body in the box was Thomas. There was still no head, therefore no identification. And even if these were Thomas's remains, no one could prove how she had died. Webster's other problem was that while she protested her innocence, she kept changing her story. In the court transcript, there are three different statements that she gave that are all slightly different and easily disproved by the plethora of witnesses and alibis for both Church and Porter. The jury took only one hour and 15 minutes to deliberate. The guilty verdict was a foregone conclusion. Webster was not the kind, gentle, obedient image of a woman that Victorian society expected. She tried to usurp her mistress's place in society, making her a threat to the social hierarchy. Heaven forbid. According to the Times, when she was asked if she had anything to say in response to the ruling, Webster told the judge, I am not guilty, my lord, of the murder, and I never done it. But the next twist comes as this, Webster pleads her belly. It's a wonderfully archaic phrase for essentially claiming that she's pregnant. And no God-fearing Christian judge is going to execute a woman who is pregnant and kill the innocent unborn child. This wasn't a bad idea on Webster's part, because women had done it before in the past, that when a crime that they'd done was so shocking, it gave people time to calm down and recover from the shock, and death sentences would be commuted to um, something a lot less serious. But it did throw Justice Denman into a bit of a tiz because in his 32-year career, 32 year career, no one had ever thrown this at him. So a clerk of the Assize then decided that to use an even more archaic practice known as a jury of matrons to decide whether Webster was pregnant. Basically, 12 women were sworn in and they got to prod and poke Webster to see if they could feel the quickening of the child, which is another way of saying that they can feel the child moving. Again, this is a very inact way 
inaccurate way of determining whether someone is pregnant or not. But they find 12 willing women who, along with the surgeon Bond, um, went to examine Webster. The matrons found her not to be pregnant after a matter of minutes, and the sentence stood. But I think it tells you something that from the speed of the examination that she didn't stand a chance. These women wanted her to hang, simple as that. When the news of the jury of matrons began to spread, apparently the president of the Obstetrical Society of London made a protest that such an antiquated and unscientific examination had been allowed to take place. On the 8th of July, Webster was sent to Wandsworth Prison. Now, Webster continued to stick to her story that she'd been the puppet of powerful men like Church, Porter, and Strong, the mysterious Mr. Strong that apparently was her son's father. But even her Catholic priest, Father McEnery, didn't believe her, and he's begging her to confess as the execution date comes closer. On Monday, the 28th of July, 1879, she finally cracked the night before execution and told McEnery what had happened. And I quote, I alone committed the murder of Mrs. Thomas. I was slightly excited by having taken some drink, and when my mistress came home, I was aggravated by her manner. I pushed her down the stairs and then strangled her. She then detailed in graphic levels of information how she disposed of the body. And apparently it was so gruesome that the priest felt it needed to be toned down for her actual confession. Then on Tuesday, the 29th of July, 1879, at 9 a.m., at the age of only 30, Kate Webster was executed at Wandsworth Prison and given the macabre title of the only woman to ever be executed at Wandsworth Prison. The only witnesses present were the sheriff, the surgeon, and the chaplain. No reporters were permitted. But the sheriff reported that Mrs. Webster had met her death with dignity. Her body was buried in a shallow grave on the prison grounds and covered with lime. And in a piece about Webster's sentence, the Times then reported, and I quote, the execution of a woman is a rare and melancholy occurrence, but the crime in this case was so heinous and the circumstances attending it so revolting that no voice could possibly be raised against the doom inflicted. The day after the execution, a chaotic sale of Webster's possessions took place. Everyone wanted a piece, a souvenir of the Richmond murderess. And then you have another wonderful quote from the Penny Illustrated paper um, on the 2nd of August. The public must be greatly relieved at the world being rid of so atrocious a criminal, a criminal who sculpts not to endeavour to incriminate innocent men to shield herself from the consequences of a monstrous crime. A few weeks after her arrest, a waxwork of Webster was actually made and put on display at Madame Two Swords. This is the picture of it from the guidebook. It's absolutely terrifying. The guidebook actually stated that the description was Catherine Webster executed in Wandsworth Jail July 29, 1879 for the murder of Mrs. Thomas at Richmond under circumstances of unparalleled atrocity. She would stay in this display for 60 years. And I do feel that it is rather telling that when you look up the story on Wikipedia, this is the image you get greeted with first. But what does this whole rather sorry episode of history tell us about Victorian Britain and its values? Well, first of all, people talk about dark tourism as being a really modern thing. Oh, it's so not. The Victorians did it, again, way better than we could today. This fascination with crime, it's something that probably the further back in history you go, you'll still find um, evidence of it. Apparently, 597 newspaper articles were written about Webster and her trial. And it, it was a huge media sensation, because it was noted on the 12th of July by the Illustrated Police News that the Crown Prince of Sweden and Norway dropped in on the trial when visiting London. It was that big a deal. It was an international sensation. But this whole fascination with um, crime, true crime as we call it today, you just have to look at some of the headlines on the newspapers that I was looking at when I was putting my research together. So these are all actually available in local studies, um, um, one floor up from the museum. So highlighted in the red box, because I'm aware it's difficult to see, because these newspapers, they're brilliant. They're about this big, though, so they're not very um, user-friendly. But in the red box, it says, fierce battle between two youths. Then here we have, furious attack on a bride. Dreadful discovery, 
attempted murder at Bromley. Then here we've got a woman rope-ending her husband. That's a bit sinister. And then another big one, the, Eus Ooh. the Euston Square murder. So this was happening at the same time as Webster's trial, and it was another servant accused of murdering their mistress, but the servant was exonerated and the case remained a mystery. But the really big thing that this tells us is that the Victorian era is a time of moral panic. Things are changing quickly, much quicker than people are used to, and it's becoming very uncertain, especially with the rise of this new middle class, what everybody's um, place in society should be. And there are even more female killers at this point that end up with massive um, stories. So going from left to right, you've got Florence Maybrick, who is an upper-class woman convicted of poisoning her husband using arsenic. She always maintained her innocence that the arsenic recipe was actually something that she had um, for a certain face cream, because, of course, at this time, face creams had things like arsenic and all sorts in them. Rather startlingly, though, her husband James has been identified as a possible candidate for the Whitechapel murders. So there you are. Her death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment for a crime that she was never actually formally charged with. She had influential friends who continued to campaign for her release, and she only served 15 years in prison. The next woman is a lady called Madeline Smith. She was a Glasgow socialite who was accused in a sensational murder trial in Scotland in 1857. She was accused of poisoning and murdering her lover, who was of a lower social status. But when she tried to end the relationship, he threatened to expose it with a voluminous and detailed correspondence in the form of love letters in a way of forcing her to marry him. Most modern scholars believe that she did commit the crime and that the only thing that saved her from a guilty verdict and the death sentence was that there was no eyewitness to prove that the couple had met in the weeks before her death. But no doubt her social status, familiar support, and ability to pay for a good legal team may have helped. The third woman is Mary Ann Cotton. She was executed for poisoning her stepson. Despite her sole conviction for murder, she is believed to have been a serial killer who may have killed as many of 11 of her 13 children and three of her four husbands for their insurance policies. Her preferred method of killing was poisoning with arsenic. The fourth lady is Adelaide Blanche Bartlett. This was a case known as the Pimlico Mystery or the Pimlico Poisoning Mystery. In 1866, Thomas Edward Bartlett was found to have had a total a fatal quantity, sorry, of chloroform found in his stomach, but without any damage to his throat or windpipe and no evidence of how it got there. Adelaide was tried for her husband's murder, but was acquitted because the prosecution could not prove how Mrs. Bartlett committed the crime. Note that out of these four women, the only one who is executed is the working class one. So what this really tells you is that the Victorian era is characterised as the domestic age par excellence, which is epitomised by Queen Victoria. There she is in the middle with her thousands of children. She came to represent a kind of femininity that was centred on familyhood, motherhood and respectability, an image that was very carefully crafted by both herself and, of course, her darling husband, Albert. But I love that the fact that this is a horrendously flimsy image. As much as she tried to create this public image that she's nothing like her Hanoverian uncles, she was exactly like them. She had a ferocious temper, she loved sex and food, and she hated children, especially babies, because she said they looked like frogs. Webster was the antithesis of everything that Victoria was extolling. She was a working class woman who should have been meek, submissive, knowing her place, and eternally grateful to her employer, no matter how hard the work was, no matter how degrading it was, or how badly paid it was. They should just go, yes, please, thank you very much more, please. The Victorian ideal of true motherhood demanded women be constantly present for their children. And though some said that she was devoted to her son, she was unmarried and leaving him with other people while she found work or committed crime. Women were supposed to be moral guardians in the domestic sphere, but the real crisis comes that what happens when they make the home a place of danger. So women like the ones I've just highlighted, they are betraying their gender when they make the home a place of danger and violence. But what terrified people most about Webster is that she did, she dismembered a person and disposed of the body without the help of a man. Despite the population boom in Richmond, 
and the wealth boom, life was hard for a lot of working class people and there was no sympathy for those who struggled or were unable to achieve the impossibly high standards of the time due to lack of money, familiar support or education. In all of the sources that I've read, you never hear anything about Webster's parents or siblings. So perhaps her uncle was her only living relative. It's full of bigotry because, again, so many sources refer to Webster as a sex worker, but there's no real evidence of this. But they use the phrase, most likely, because the idea that all poor women would fall back on this trade simply because they are poor. I've even read claims that Webster had an affair with the son of her friend Sarah Kreese. The idea that she has unnatural sexual appetites and not staying within societal norms. She's demonic and delinquent and unsatiable. It makes me think a little bit, and again, we're jumping back several hundred years, to the way they demonize Anne Boleyn when um, Henry VIII wants to get rid of her. She's not just a bad woman, she's the most evil of women because it's the only way society can make peace with the whole thing. But the big question is, was Webster guilty? Almost certainly. But however, I genuinely do not think it was premeditated. And right at the end, she does say this in her final confession. I think it's really difficult to say that she could be convicted on the testimony of this one person. So Mary Durden, the straw bonnet maker from Kingston, the, per the court transcripts don't outline whether she was cross-examined and whether her character actually stood up to scrutiny. For all we know, she might have hated Webster and saw this as her chance to get her own back on her. The reality is, whether it was a premeditated murder or not, it was a spur or a spur of the act, act moment of anger and violence, she never stood a chance. She was a threat to society and the patriarchy's expectations of what she should be. She was a single mother. She failed to remain chaste and therefore her um, becoming mother meant she led to, into a life of crime. Though that's not technically true because she was committing crimes before John was born. She was Irish and therefore an alcoholic. So the prejudices caused by this mass emigration of Irish as a result of the Great Famine of 1849 that led to these stereotypes of, of the Irish as drunken and criminal in nature. The lack of fa familial support. Whenever her family is mentioned, as I say, it's just her uncle. But I do need to do more research on this, but it makes you, uh, the idea if you've got just this one uncle who's begrudgingly looking after his niece, it wouldn't have been an easy um, bringing, upbringing. The fact that she's female is also against her, and the fact that she's physically strong, because of course you've got the stereotype of the Victorian lady, all frail and dainty, fainting fits, needing to be revived with smelling salts. We just sit around and play the piano and stitch all day. We don't have a single thought that goes through her head. This was all added to by her stoic nature in court. And to be honest, I can understand her being completely stoic considering the life that she's gone through. A properly feminine woman would have been penitent and emotional, but on the 17th of May, the Illustrated Police News noted that she sustained an unbroken silence during the whole of the proceedings. Apparently, it would have been more becoming of a woman to be screaming and crying the entire way through the trial. In fact, it was noted that the only time she ever showed emotion was when her son was mentioned in the court proceedings. This was reported again in the Illustrated Police News on the 17th of May, that when Sarah Crees was telling how Webster came to take John from her when she was trying to make the escape to Ireland, the witness was very fond of the little boy and kissed him and wishes him goodbye. And at this point, um, at the mention of John's name, Crees burst into tears and so did Webster and she wept for a considerable time. And then you have this, front, this illustration um, of Crease fainting at the, um, when she gives her evidence. But you've got Webster, who I think might be the one on the left-hand side because they don't mention it in the description. She's got a completely blank, unmoved face. She's not showing any concern for the fact that her friend's about to fall off a chair. <sighs> Something else that also didn't help her case is that she's proven to be a liar. But again, this is one of the few tools she had for her survival in a world where the odds were very much stacked against her. But lies like this destroyed that oh-so-precious reputation that a Victorian woman was expected to cultivate. Public opinion would also not forgive the fact that she tried to blame innocent men for the crime, another very unfeminine thing to do. But the reason why I feel like I need to give Kate the benefit of the doubt that this wasn't premeditated was because of John. I genuinely think that she was a loving mother because why else would she go back for John when she made her escape? It could have cost her a lot of time and extra money. 
I also think that her real anger at Thomas for not being kinder to her was giving her, a, it was stopping her from having her chance to be respectable. She could have left John with anyone at any time. She could have abandoned him. She could have left him at the workhouse, anything like that. But she always kept him with her. So part of me thinks that she saw this chance of working with Thomas, like, right, this is my chance. I'm going to go straight. I'm going to be a good mother to my son. I'm not going to do any more stealing. This is my opportunity. Because especially the reason why she gets her job with uh, Mrs. Thomas is because she has a good reference from Mrs. Loder, the woman who worked with her before. And if any of you have ever had a micromanaging boss who undermines every little thing that you do and makes your daily work day a nightmare, you can kind of understand why resentment would start growing and you'd get more and more frustrated and angry. Sadly, we don't know what happened to John. What I did find out is that Webster's uncle, as I said, refused to care for him, so he got sent to the local workhouse, and the plan was to send him to an industrial school that the idea was children under 14 um, that hadn't convicted any crimes yet, they'd be trained up, given skills, so they wouldn't repeat their parents' mistakes. However, it was normal for such children like this to be sent back to the parish of their birth, so this would have been Kingston. This is another area to do some research, but it would be very, very difficult to find out what happened to John because the reality was he'd probably be given a new name. So again, make that clean break from his criminal mother to give him a fresh start. And he might have even been sent somewhere like Canada or Australia to really cement this fresh start. But however, this is not the end of the story. We have a surprising modern twist. Yes. In 2010, the Hole in the Wall pub was bought by the latest owner of Thomas's home. They wanted to stop developers redeveloping the site so, and use the land to add to their garden. So whilst the contractors were clearing the site where, where the pub stables had once stood, they found a skull, as you do. After months of work, including radiocarbon dating at the University of Edinburgh, which dated the skull between 1650 and 1880, the West London coroner, Alison Thompson, formally identified the skull as that of Julia Thomas and recorded a death of unlawful killing with the cause of death as asphyxiation and a head injury at an inquest held on the 5th of July, 2011. The location of where the skull was buried and the fact that the skull had fracture marks consistent with Webster's account of Thomas falling slash being thrown down the stairs and a low collagen account, count, which apparently means that you know that the, bo the bones have been boiled, it kind of seemed to tie up all the loose ends of what happened to Thomas's missing skull all those years ago. They couldn't do any DNA testing because, very sadly, Thomas has no direct descendants and no other potential relatives came forward. But the police called the outcome, and this is a lovely quote, a good example of how good old-fashioned detective work, historical records, and technical advan technological advances can come together to solve the Barnes mystery. The skull was then later buried in the lawn section of Richmond Cemetery in August 2011. Sadly, it couldn't be reunited with the rest of um, her remains in the cemetery as the location had been lost. But why are so people so interested in a long forgotten crime? And to be honest, it has been very much forgotten because it gets usurped by the Whitechapel murders which happen a year later. We have very much inherited a love of gore from the Victorians, as shown by the continuing popularity of true crime podcasts, murder investigation series, and thousands of books written about true crime over the years. Nothing ever really changes. And there are studies being done as to why people are fascinated with true crime, and it covers all things like being prepared, knowing your enemy. Um, they often do have engaging and fascination, fascinating stories. There's that eternal tension of what it is to be good or evil, and the reassurance that, oh, I'm not a murderer, isn't that lovely? Oh, I haven't been murdered, brilliant. And of course, it's always difficult. It's a weird human thing. You can't not look at an accident. We all rub a neck when there's an accident on the um, most when we're going down. And especially when the media will promote the story as they know it will get the more readers, new viewer, more viewers, and more clicks. To quote an oft-used phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, it's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> but there you are. But in this case, there is a very unique reason as to why, over 100 years later, it captures the public's imagination once more. Because the new owner of the house that was Vine Cottages and the site of the Hole in the Wall pub 
David Attenborough. <laughs> so add in a beloved ce celebrity to the tale of a murder most horrid, and you have quite the story on your hands. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions you have if we've got time. Thank you. Victorian melodrama or what? No, I know. <laughs> Personally, I think the next thing you ought to be doing is not more research, but writing a screenplay for Netflix. Oh. <laughs> you know, there's everything in it, isn't there? There's a bit of, bit of class, you know, and the posh and the not-so-posh. Yeah. There's the upstairs, downstairs bit. There's the police hunt. There's an international element. Trial at the Old Bailey, all racism, that network of issues with immigrants, exactly. people in small boats coming over and causing problems. You know, there's the and the networking that goes on amongst all the finding yeah. all those different witnesses. So, uh, I think it has a great future with Netflix, personally. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, questions from anybody? There's a lot of content in there this evening, so you may have covered all the ground, but here we go. So you, you say her trial was quite a long trial, mm. she had a leading counsel um, who presumably was somewhat competent if it was a long trial because they're incompetent really short. Who paid for that, do we know? Again, I haven't been able to find out in the records yet because it's not the main um, source for the information I've been using for this is the newspapers because, again, a lot of these things... They d it's not, it's one of the really frustrating things about women's history. There's so many things fall in the cracks because it's not interesting enough or anything like that. Because again, I can't even find a picture of the lawyer and there's a very limited amount of information about him on Wikipedia. It's some, it does make you wonder if that because he lost the court case, he then kind of disappears quietly because it's a bit of a PR disaster. But yeah, it'd be so interesting to find out a bit more about it. But it's one of these things that just gets brushed under the carpet for working class women, unfortunately. Yeah. How's that? Um, you said that she went to visit someone a week or so towards the end of February who swore that she said that she'd inherited yes. her aunt had died. Was that? And then she said it wasn't premeditated. Late, this is the thing. Know, we herself. don't know if the straw bonnet maker from Kingston is lying or not. Uh, yes, right. Yes. That's the thing, because it's one of the really frustrating things that you see in Victorian trials. That, and it was a there was a case that I used at my last museum that they could be incredibly one-sided, and it really did depend on your class and your wealth. So as I say, most of the transcript is church and porter, because that's the prosecution, that's where the money is that's being thrown at it. Whereas in other ones, you'll find that working class people, they don't even have lawyers. The chances are Kate only had a lawyer because it was such a sensational case, and the guy thought, oh, if I can get her off, I can make my name on this, and I'll be rich beyond compare. I will go down in infamy. So, yeah, it's really weird, one of these things. Because they never cross-examine her. They never sort of pick apart, like, well, why would you say this? Do you hate Kate? Is there jealousy on here? Is this one of Mr. Strong's other lovers or anything like that? The, this is where the defence really don't do their job. But it's, yeah, the Victorian legal system is a weird old creature. It's nothing compared to what we'd recognise today. <laughs> Anybody else? I don't know if you've looked in any of Ian's courts records. If you know the name of the, the defence lawyer, mm. then each inn will have records going back, certainly to Victorian times. No. So that's so, one point. And the other point is... So where was that, sorry? The, the inns of court. I mean, he would have been a member of Inner Temple okay. or Middle Temple or Gray's Inn or whatever. Uh, and they have records going back a long time. That's one point. The second point is that very often people acted pro bono. Mm. So if it was a sensational case, uh, somebody might well think this they could it. make their, their I'll name. do it for free because then I'll be infamous and it'll make my fortune. Well, not, <laughs> not, not necessarily. I mm. mean, I think people genuinely did it because uh, if you were a defendant, it was very difficult unless you had, had money. Yeah. This is it. Again, it would be... If I, if I had more time, I would love to do more research on this because the more you learn about the story, it does just ping up more questions. And there's, a, there's a risk, isn't there, that we, we are imposing our value judgments on Victorian times. Mm. I mean, if you think of the social context where 
the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, so you've got a massive population transfer. Mm -hmm. As you've said, the middle classes have money and so forth. But in most societies, at most stages, taking human life is regarded as a heinous crime, whatever your yeah. civilization or so forth. So by its very nature, you're going to get public revulsion and public interest. Yeah. And you've got a rise in literacy, cheap papers. Mm -hmm. So all the ingredients are there for sensationalism. Very good, much so. Good points. Any more for any more? You came across the story originally, because you it sounded like you've researched it, but it's unfolded before your eyes. <laughs> but was there something that drew you your attention to it? It was a podcast. There is a podcast called Law, L-O-R-E, that was recommended to me. And it specialises in stories like this, the weird and the wonderful. They've done episodes about spiritualism, all kind of weird and wonderful things like that. And it was the really surreal moment when they're, oh, they're talking about Richmond, they're talking about Richmond. And then I'm in front of Richmond Theatre and they're talking about David Attenborough. And I'm like, no. Yeah, so it's genuinely a complete, utter accident. And I think it was back in 2017. And then all of a sudden people be like, oh, because I've only been working here for a year. They're like, oh, is that to do with the skull in David Attenborough's garden? And I'm like, yes. So everyone remembers that bit, but so few people knew the story before that. And then it was just like, I want to find out more. And it just... Then I got um, a school wanting to do a workshop on Victorian crime and punishment, and I was like, this is my chance, this is my excuse, because it does have a lot of fantastic things that we can still pick apart for the kids today. Things like sexism, misogyny, immigration, how the law treats you, because there have been some sources that say that the way that the Irish treated in, were treated in Victorian times is the way that the black treat, people are treated today. doesn't mean if you've led a perfect life, if a racist Met Police officer decides they want to stop and search you, it's just the way that it is. So it's been really, really interesting. <laughs> so yeah, um, complete and utter accident, <laughs> and it's kind of spiralled out of control. <laughs> I noticed that David Antrim's doing a... He's in the news again because he's doing a documentary on the, um, the dinosaur skull. Yes. So perhaps you ought to be doing a d one on, on this. So. I would love to do that. <laughs> oh, he could be in my Netflix. There you he go. He can be my narrator. Yes, yes, perfect. Oh, it's all coming that, together, guys. That's, that's, that's the hook for <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, apologies in advance. Uh, I may well have misheard you, but was it true that um, she married and had four children and was widowed before she came to England at the age of 18. She says that, but they could find no records for it. Right. But it may have been a common law marriage, we, or she just might be making it up to make herself sound more respectable. Because okay. a widowed woman would have kind of more social standing than a single woman. Yes. with or without children at that point. So it would have been a good way of her kind of clawing a bit of respectability as opposed to this impoverished Irish girl who's got no parents trying to make her own way in the world by selling other people's things. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, what an interesting talk and some really good questions there, so thank you for that. But I think it's time to party, don't Yes, you? I'm aware I did talk a little bit longer than I was supposed so, to, but no, you've been a wonderful audience. I, I thank you very much. I think you gripped everybody. So <laughs> let us say thank you very much to Vicky. Thank you.